Most of us know that uh, the incidence of prostate cancer far outpaces the death rate. And this is one of the areas that we address today about screening, is we identify a, a lot of men who are not going to die from prostate cancer. And if we treat those men, that results in over-treatment. And that is why one, the, one of the reasons why the task force um, recommended against routine PSA screening. Um, fortunately, most urologists are now embracing active surveillance for appropriately selected patients. And these days, that's pretty much a consensus for low-risk patients or very low-risk patients, which are primarily those men with Gleason score 6 cancer. I don't think there's much argument um, about that. All of the guidelines, at least that I've reviewed, have now started to include selected men with intermediate risk prostate cancer um, as being candidates for active surveillance. Um, unfortunately, none of them tell you how to select those men. Um, and it becomes um, problematic in terms of someone's diagnosed with uh, intermediate risk, should they be a candidate for active surveillance or not. If you look at the literature in the field, there are actually four randomized trials which have looked at treatment versus either watchful waiting or active surveillance. Um, and if you specifically look at the intermediate risk population, all of the studies suggest treatment is better than watching. So this is a study, two studies, the PIVOT trial, which I think everyone's familiar with, similar type design for the, the study from Europe, but basically they looked at radical prostatectomy versus um, observation. And if you look at the curves on the bottom, those patients uh, that were treated with surgery did far better than those patients that uh, were managed with uh, watchful waiting in the intermediate risk group. So it's hard to um, get a sense of, well, why are the um, American and European um, groupings recommending active surveillance in this population? Similarly, from the, the PROTEC trial of Freddie Hamdi's study, if you look at the deaths from prostate cancer within 10 years, as expected, there's very few. Um, unfortunately, if you look at metastatic progression, um, it's much higher in the uh, active surveillance arms than in the treatment arm. So again, suggesting that um, a global statement about intermediate risk prostate cancer being amenable to active surveillance, it's a, it's a bit of perplexing um, as a global statement uh, for these men. If you look at the PREFER trial, another European study from uh, um, Albers and, and colleagues, again, there's a, a distinct difference in the likelihood of uh, reclassification basically on biopsy, whether you start with Gleason score six or Gleason score three plus four equals seven cancer. So again, not much help in terms of patient selection in any of the, or from any of the four randomized trials that we've had. There are 14 other series um, looking at intermediate risk, favorable intermediate risk. And again, follow-up is relatively short two to eight years, again, not much metastatic disease, no prostate cancer deaths, and the numbers are actually quite good, but they give no guidance as to how do you select a man with intermediate risk prostate cancer who is most likely to do well with active surveillance, or put another way, which man with favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer should be treated um, rather than watched. So, as with most things active surveillance, we have to rely on Dr. Klotz. I'll start with a study, however, from Göteborg in Sweden. And what that did, again, 15-year um, prostate cancer-specific survival. So we're getting a little bit longer, certainly longer than 10 years. And most men are doing quite well. They're not dying of prostate cancer uh, within 15 years. It's a little bit less with intermediate risk. Again, these were more favorably selected patients, although what favorable meant to this population, um, we don't know. Um, it's not well delineated in the paper. But one of Dr. Klotz's many contributions to the field is he did show, at least in the preliminary analysis of, of their study, that patients with intermediate risk disease were much higher um, uh, uh, in a much higher risk category for developing metastasis at 15 years. He also, however, appropriately pointed to the presence of pattern four and the amount of pattern four as being critically important.
And this is sort of the three plus four versus four plus three, so it's sort of global, 50% one way or the other. But those patients that were three plus four, a lower percentage of pattern four, did far better than those men who were four plus three. So giving a suggestion, well, perhaps if we looked a little bit more closely into the percentage of pattern four, we might be able to discern a group of men who may be best amenable to active surveillance. And we actually had information from this from radical prostatectomy series. This is from the Martini Clinic, and they looked at men with Gleason, pattern seven prostate cancer, who had undergone radical prostatectomy. And if you look at the amount of pattern four broken down into basically 10 percentage groups, those patients with the least amount of pattern four, 5%, fared very similar to those men with Gleason six. So again, suggesting that a quantitation of pattern four, even in the three plus four setting, could identify patients who were at higher or lower risk, even though they were all under the umbrella of favorable intermediate risk. The group at Michigan, oh, so that's a little cartoon. So the group at Michigan uh, found a similar thing. Uh, again, the percentage of pattern four in a radical prostatectomy uh, specimen uh, correlated with outcome. So those men with a relatively small amount of pattern four did far better than those men with a higher amount of pattern four. Now, Samson Fine, who's a pathologist at Memorial, took this a little bit um, further in terms of looking at biopsies and looking at different ways to quantitate pattern four. And he looked at percentage pattern four within a given biopsy, percentage of pattern four within the all biopsies, and he also looked at millimeters length. And because percentages are guided by the actual length of the core, percentages can vary. You can have 5% pattern four, but if it's in a 20 millimeter core versus a five millimeter core, there's going to be a different volume of disease. So what he found is that actually it's the linear length. You have to know millimeters, not percentages. Now, they, they're associated, of course, um, but if you look at the total length of pattern four, and under one millimeter is a, a good, good way to remember it, those patients with less than one millimeter of Gleason pattern four behave very similarly to those men that have uh, Gleason grade six or grade group one cancers. So again, quantitation of pattern four, um, again, millimeters of pattern four is important. And I know MRIs are not always looked on favorably at this meeting, but we looked at in another way how to look at patients with Gleason three plus four equals seven, underwent radical prostatectomy. Some had negative MRIs, the others had positive MRIs. And those who actually had a negative MRI did much better, at least according to pathology, than those men who had a positive MRI. So suggesting that perhaps in the favorable intermediate risk group, a selection criteria might be a negative MRI. Now this is just one study, um, it's preliminary data, but in terms of starting out an active surveillance program and favorable intermediate risk, you might think about Gleason grade four length and MRI status. So certainly we've started, and I think many people in the audience have started, using active surveillance in selected patients. We select them by um, amount of Gleason pattern four, linear length, uh, a millimeter or less. We prefer a negative MRI, we don't demand it. If they do have a positive MRI, they will get an early repeat biopsy to be sure that we have not underassessed the amount of pattern four. Um, there certainly are a number of ongoing questions, and there are smarter folks in the room here than, my, than me that uh, can address these. And is risk totally driven by pattern four? Meaning if we know pattern four, do we need anything else? Do we need to utilize all of the genetic testing that's on the market to identify someone who is or is not a candidate for active surveillance? I don't know that. How do we quantitate multiple biopsies from the same sample or from the same site. 
So typically if we do an MRI targeted biopsy, we'll do two or more biopsies. Do we use the longest length in one biopsy? Do we sum the biopsies and do an average? Do we add it all up? How do we handle multiple samples from the same site? Does the amount of pattern six matter? Do we have to follow Epstein criteria or is that really historic? I think Dr. Klotz has shown that the volume of six probably isn't as important, um, but what about in the patient with a component of Gleason 7? Does that contribute to their risk? I don't know. What about other factors, PSA density? So as we delve into the um, arena of doing active surveillance in favorable intermediate risk patients, we should pick the most favorable. Small amount of pattern four, perhaps a tendency to select men that have negative MRIs, and if we look at PSA density and the like, selecting those in the more favorable category. So I finished on time. Thank you very much.